thank you very, very much for the invitation. Uh, and thanks so much for that introduction, Pete. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the idea of natural fertility and why I think that if we take cultural evolution seriously, we can't keep relying on it uh, in the way that we currently do. In evolutionary anthropology, of course, we want to understand social dynamics and cultural dynamics in the past um, that we can never observe or things that we have only partial evidence about. And so we rely on storytelling, on narrative to motivate us as well as to make sense of our research. So like this artist's impression here of hunter-gatherer family, family life in the late Mesolithic, we see the representation of primitive dwellings, large animals caught through cooperative hunting, the manufacture of stone tools, the presence of commensal animals like dogs, the cooperative rearing of children, the gender division of labor, all based on partial and often contested archeological evidence. And we need to ask ourselves what gets left out of these stories when we use concepts that naturalize some elements of the behavior in this picture, uh, but allows others uh, to be culturally evolving. And so what I wanna do in this talk uh, is four things. I want to convince you that natural fertility is not a useful concept for cultural evolution. I want to show you some quantitative anthropological work uh, incorporating cultural evolution ideas into demographic analysis. So that's based on my research uh, on the demographic transition in Poland. I then wanna show you why ethnography is essential to rejecting natural fertility and to contextualizing fertility better. And that will focus on the research I've been doing in Vanuatu since 2015. And finally, I want to give you a worked example of how I think we can take this uh, set of research practices forward uh, by showing you an example uh, of translating an ethnography into uh, a model that we can use to think through these ideas using previous research uh, from the Gambia. So as you all know, there's been an explosion uh, of interest in the effects of human demography on culture, and in particular, how macro level features like population size, density, age structure, and connectivity have affected the evolution of cultural and linguistic traits in the human past. Most of this research is focused on one direction of this relationship, from macro level demography to culture, and not typically the other way around. The pick almost any model in cultural evolution, but also in the broader population sciences and genetics, and the assumptions about demographic growth are quite ecologically deterministic. The basic idea will be more resources equals more people. And when you look at human population growth in the longest possible term, it certainly looks like basic resources are the only things that matter for human fertility. For example, in the Neolithic, we see a transition from a fluctuating equilibrium of low fertility and mortality to one of high fertility and mortality, which we associate with the transition to farming within the last 10,000 years. And we see the inverse of this process in the contemporary demographic transition, again, associated with profound social and economic changes that started in Europe before the Industrial Revolution. And there's a revealing mismatch between how these two transitions get described in terms of the individual behavior that generates them, specifically a psychological difference. Um, the paleodemographer Jean-Pierre bouquet appel describes it in this way. The major difference between the two demographic transitions is that the cause of the Neolithic one was unconscious, determined by the mechanical effect on maternal energetics of the invention of the agricultural economy, while the essential cause of the contemporary transition was conscious, the will to control reproduction. And there's a clear narrative here that goes from ecological and physical determinism in the past, where there's no consciousness about or control over reproduction, to modern autonomy and conscious choice in the present. And the aim of my research is to draw attention to problems with this distinction when it comes to reproductive behavior and to advocate for a much broader culturally evolutionary understanding of the micro foundations of demography in the past as well as in the present. Because what can look like stasis at one level of aggregation often looks very different at other levels. So across these very different scales here, our models assume what's called demographic uniformitarianism. The idea that demographic mechanisms are the same, no matter what level you examine them at. So we make assumptions about birth and death rates, sometimes age structure that we assume to be universal to help us move between these different scales. But of course the data that we have is often at different levels and it's hard to make inferences from them directly. So we sometimes have, for example, uh, archeological data and genetic data at the regional scale here, but most of social science or anthropological data or even demography data that informs our inferences is drawn from the micro level and from even finer grained spatial and temporal scales. So even patterns 
that look like basic Malthusian dynamics at one scale are rarely quite so simple when you're talking about the behavior of individuals living under those particular conditions. So I'll give you an example from the Neolithic. Um, this is a paper from Shannon and colleagues showing estimates of population densities based on radiocarbon dating in different regions of Neolithic Europe. So in red and light blue are the significant deviations from the null model of exponential growth, with the blue arrows here indicating the first evidence for agriculture in each of these regions. Now, in every case, agriculture is associated with booms followed by population crashes and recoveries. But in every case, these changes are not associated with regional climate change. And that means that the processes generating these dynamics are endogenous. Um, they're not strictly ecologically determined. But what could these population mechanisms be? Um, cultural evolution teaches us to assume that ecological responses are mediated by culture, but we still don't know very much about what kinds of sociocultural processes generate these kinds of dynamics. Now, compared to other great apes, human females reach menarche and start reproducing much later. But humans have shorter interbirth intervals, weaning their children early, stacking multiple dependent children, and effectively squeezing more reproduction into a shorter period of time. And we know that this is one of the differences between the replacement fertility that we see in other great apes and the huge capacity for growth uh, in humans. And we do all of this by getting other people to help. So this idea that it takes a village uh, is baked into the way that humans reproduce. And uh, Sarah Hurdy has argued that humans are actually obligate cooperative breeders similar to social systems found in, in other species. And there's a whole literature now that examines kin effects on reproduction under this framework and how investment differs depending on uh, the ecological and social context. And while all of this work is about the social context of reproduction, it would not be fair to call it a cultural model. Ultimately, the, uh, the assumption that humans are cooperative breeders comes from this cross species comparison and not necessarily from an assessment of the cross cultural variation. And this is the point, it's this elaboration of reproductive cultures that is crucial for humans, because people, and marry, people marry and reproduce according to their own rules. So let me give you a really, really simple example from the field of kinship studies. You may know that in 1839, uh, Charles Darwin married Emma Wedgwood, who was his first cousin. And like many gentlemen of his time, finding a spouse amongst your cousins was a conscious strategy. It was an important family concern. In the West, we tend to organize our families into this familiar kind of genealogy. Now these kinship terms aren't just linguistic labels, they structure people's roles and responsibilities. In this case, for the purposes of this example, who you can marry. What you might not know is that only about 11% of the world's societies organize their families in this way. But because this particular structure maps on to how we calculate genetic relatedness, it's very easy to slip into thinking that it's a template for all of humanity. But that isn't the case. Kinship structures populations in diverse ways around the world, often that have little to do with genetic relatedness. If Darwin had been born in Hawaii instead of 19th century Britain, Emma would have been classified as his sister, making their marriage impossible. And if he'd been born in parts of the Americas, she would have been classified as his mother, even though the underlying genetic relationships are exactly the same. But cultural evolutionists are really interested in this kind of diversity, in the basic organizing principles of human life. We don't assume that before the Neolithic, there were no kinship relations or networks of exchange that were guided by language and culture. But for some reason, we do tend to assume that the reproductive outcomes of these features are somehow not guided by complex cultural worldviews, or at least we don't represent them. Now, this situation is, is changing, but to the extent that culture is used in demography and evolutionary anthropology, it's best summed up by the anthropologist Eugene Hamill, who wrote about this more than 30 years ago. Uh, and he said the use of culture and demography is mired in structural functional concepts that are about 40 years old, hardening rapidly and showing every sign of fossilization. Now, he argued that the study of demographic behavior has actually been hampered by the widespread use of, uh, of culture in very uh, inappropriate and different guises. And he advocated for a much uh, broader use uh, of fine grained studies and, uh, and of ethnography. So I agree with Hamill. Um, and the main roadblock that I think we need to get out of the way first is natural fertility. So this is the definition of natural fertility. It's fertility that exists or has existed in the absence of deliberate birth control. Um, the factors affecting natural fertility aren't solely physiological, so social factors can also play a part, sexual taboos, for example. Uh, and importantly, control can be said uh, to exist when the behavior of the couple is bound to the number of children that are already born 
and is modified when that number reaches the maximum the couple doesn't want to exceed. This definition actually includes cultural mechanisms in the definition of something that is supposed to be naturalized. On this standard definition, reproductive control really only exists if you have explicit numerical preferences and if you use contraception to achieve them. And it's an important thing here uh, to say, which is that this idea turns less on the idea of biological versus cultural determinants of reproduction and more on the idea of passive versus deliberative, i.e. conscious reproductive strategizing. And in that sense, it's identical to the quote in the beginning. In reality, I want to argue that there's no such thing as a natural state of fertility. Um, and naturalizing some people's fertility and not others is dubious for a number of reasons. First of all, it lets us slip into thinking that high fertility is somehow unregulated, whereas low fertility is the result of conscious decision-making. It creates problematic dichotomies between so-called traditional and modern populations based only on the number of children they have, when instead fertility is a spectrum of diversity. It's dubious because it creates a biased narrative about human reproductive consciousness before the demographic transition. And it's politically dubious to think that reproduction is always a private domestic activity generally limited to women, when in fact how, when and where people reproduce is often at the core of political and social life. All of these slippages limit our theorizing because they make the cultural influences on reproduction invisible. And that's precisely what researchers across the social sciences and humanities have been saying for decades. We currently don't have a way to integrate the work that's being done in many different disciplines, much of it qualitative, with the kind of debates that are happening in, uh, in evolution and demography. So let me give you a few ideas of how uh, varied these different reproductive mechanisms can be. For women in the Gambia, your age isn't determined by how many years you've been alive. It's determined by how much reproductive activity you've experienced. You move between different indigenously defined age categories, depending on how you curate your reproductive career. For example, by spacing your births and wasting less of the reproductive energy that God has determined for you. So when modern contraceptives were introduced here, it allowed women to more tightly control their spacing strategies, which actually led to higher fertility uh, than any of the family planning interventions had anticipated. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to this example later because this is the example I'll show you a worked model of. In Indonesian Papua, the, Mar the Marindanam had a practice called Otit Bombari, in which women had uh, ritualized sexual intercourse with up to 10 men of their husband's clan on the night of their marriage or on their return to village life after childbirth. While intended to promote fertility, uh, it actually led to widespread sterility once sexually transmitted diseases were introduced. Uh, and as a result, between 10% to 25% of the population at any time was made up of kidnapped and, adop and adopted children from other ethno-linguistic groups as part of a rich cosmology of head hunting and expansionary raiding. In China and many other places, cultural preferences for sons over daughters have led to sex selective infanticide and abortion generating extremely skewed sex ratios and a staggering estimate of up to 50 million so-called missing women in China alone. In Germany and other countries, what we might call cultures of childlessness are developing uh, that downvalue biological reproduction altogether. Uh, and that leads to rapid aging uh, with about 40% of Germans expected to be over the age of 60 by the middle of the century. But do people really make decisions about reproduction in the same way in these different cultural environments? How can we take indigenous categories and concepts more seriously in the way that we do our research on these questions? And how can we start to understand how population level changes affect how these kinds of cultural mechanisms themselves might be changing over time? Those are some of the questions that uh, my research group is focused on. Now, another thing to know about natural fertility is that it's not necessarily synonymous with high fertility. There's substantial overlap in the distribution of total fertilities uh, among farmers uh, represented here in black uh, and foragers and horticulturalists, which are broken down in the two graphs uh, in non-black bars. Uh, there's massive variation. And the point here is that using a high or low cutoff isn't particularly helpful for identifying what's a natural fertility population because you can have low fertility farmers and relatively high fertility foragers. But I think even more important is the fact that natural fertility at the population level can be clearly uh, socially constructed. So this plot um, shows you the distribution of interbirth interval lengths um, in three historical populations on the bottom three lines. Uh, and the top two lines here uh, are from African populations who reported using modern contraceptives or not. Uh, now the difference between the top two lines and the bottom 
three lines is explained by cultural differences in marriage patterns that affect the first intervals between marriage and first birth. But more importantly, the top two lines are practically indistinguishable from each other at this aggregate level. And the point here is that we can't necessarily make inferences about reproductive intentions or action just from population level data. It's not enough to use those aggregated patterns to infer reproductive strategies. Now, coming back to the idea that natural fertility is about a lack of deliberative reproductive strategizing, contraception is always something that people bring up. Um, here are some uh, purported contraceptives from across the ages. I'm not going to go into them in detail, um, but the point here is if contraception isn't new, then the motivation to do something about your reproduction also isn't new. And that's the thing that we want to understand. Now, you might respond by saying, OK, these are not effective contraceptives, and that's what really matters. Um, but even with effective contraceptives, um, the, you know, they're completely dependent on perfect use. Um, fertility awareness methods, for example, are, are highly accurate when used properly and just as effective as many so-called modern methods. And let's not forget also that the demographic transition itself began long before the invention of most of these methods, and mainly it was driven uh, by coitus interruptus. Moreover, birth control, you know, it doesn't require the use of modern methods. So here's just some data showing some um, <clears throat> contemporary populations uh, across the world, uh, wealthy populations, and you can see countries like Greece, Japan, and Italy, which have some of the lowest fertility rates in the world, um, using um, very low levels of modern contraception. So it's perfectly possible to reduce fertility without relying on those methods. <clears throat> so this lack of understanding about how um, people really reproduce or how they think about it or how culture influences reproduction um, has major political implications because it can lead to really sensationalist claims about the future of the human population. So, for example, the population bomb argued that hundreds of millions of people would starve to death in the 1970s. And this led to fundamentally unethical proposals from forced sterilization to taxation on large families to the withholding of development aid to high fertility countries. Um, and these predictions, the predictions were totally wrong and not for the first time because Malthus also prophesied mass immiseration, but because we simply don't know, we don't know enough about why people reproduce the way that they do. And reproduction isn't a politically neutral domain anywhere in the world. Um, focusing on things like food production and naturalized models of human reproduction are convenient ways to avoid dealing with the massive structural and political inequalities that contribute to population issues, to the disproportionate effects of climate change and the lack of reproductive justice in many areas of the world. So governments all over the world use reproductive policy to achieve reductions in fertility among undesired populations and increased desired fertility among others. Okay, a final issue. Some of the populations that I mentioned earlier would actually count as natural fertility populations. So the two populations on the left, the Gambia and the Marandanim, would be considered natural fertility, whereas the two populations on the right, China and Germany, would not. And it's not really clear why we can only include some cultural features that influence reproduction and not others. And remember, the distinction is supposed to be about deliberative decision making. The implication is, therefore, that uh, these groups on the left here are deliberating less about their reproduction. And I think this is a very dangerous space for uh, you know, racialized and other kinds of biases to creep in into these demarcations. So my research group in Leipzig responds to the significant gaps in cultural evolution's understanding of microdemography. Um, and uh, reproduction is obviously uh, the engine of evolution and it's a foundation of demography, but as, as I hope I've convinced you, it doesn't happen in a cultural vacuum. Uh, so my group is dedicated to the cultural evolution of reproduction itself, uh, bringing more detailed demographic insights into cultural evolution. And for this to work, we need three different approaches to be brought together. Uh, the first is field research that's both quantitative and ethnographic, quantitative analysis that's designed to explicitly incorporate uh, cultural evolutionary principles and theory, uh, and modeling that takes ethnography and indigenous categories seriously. And uh, we use three guiding questions for framing, uh, reframing reproduction in the group. We, we think about how does culture influence reproductive decisions? How do cultures of reproduction generate demographic patterns? And how do demographic properties themselves influence cultural evolution? Um, and uh, this is the group at the moment. Uh, we have a very diverse group of researchers uh, from computational science to osteoarchaeology to um, social demography, 
to um, political science and um, cultural evolution. So uh, these researchers are working together under a thematic banner. Okay, so I hope I've, I've convinced you that natural fertility isn't that conceptually useful. And now I wanna talk about some quantitative research um, based on two field studies, but uh, I'm gonna focus on uh, research in Poland. So over the last 15 years, I've developed two long-term field sites uh, the first in Poland and the second in Vanuatu, at two ends of the scale of ethnolinguistic diversity. Um, in Poland, I've been comparing different reproductive mechanisms across high fertility communities without the confines of ethnolinguistic variation. And in Vanuatu, on the other hand, I'm exploring maximal variation in cultures of reproduction and how they influence community demography. So why are Polish fertility dynamics complex and interesting? Well, look at the top two plots here. Poland has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world uh, with a below replacement total fertility rate around 1.2 when I collected the data. But in the plot on the right, the top right here from the communities I worked with uh, shows uh, that high completed fertility is still very common over four, uh, around four children per family. And this reflects a broad divide between rural and urban areas and between parts of Poland that were historically partitioned. So the bottom left uh, graph shows you an example of cultural legacy here. Um, here you see voting patterns from the 2010 presidential election um, in uh, two different baseline colors, so orange and blue were the two candidates. Um, and uh, on top of this, I've, I've overlaid the historical boundaries of different 18th and 19th century empires. So Poland was repeatedly partitioned between the Prussian, the Russian and the Austro-Hungarian empires. Uh, and my field project is based in the, in the rural area in the south uh, in the former Austro-Hungarian uh, region. Now the politics of reproduction are extremely polarized in Poland even today, and that partly reflects these historical uh, partitions. Reproductive rights are extremely fraught uh, with the largest protests since the 1980s happening just in the last year over access to abortion rights. And the rural communities that I worked in um, still have a strong ideal of a woman as a bastion of national values uh, and really strongly value large family sizes. So it was in this context that I wanted to understand fertility decline in a rural, highly religious area of Poland, um, because I wanted to avoid just thinking about culture as a simple classifier and get closer to the cultural mechanisms that drive fertility decline. Uh, and that's why I wanted to focus on a population that was largely uh, ethno-linguistically homogenous and look at micro-scale variations in reproductive behavior. And that means thinking in multi-level terms uh, and comparing multiple communities. So the message of the work that I'm gonna summarize is that explaining reproductive behavior requires measuring and analyzing features above and beyond uh, individual level characteristics. So this paper from 2014 um, is about community level education and how it potentially accelerates the cultural evolution of fertility decline. Uh, these are plots of predicted probabilities from a model where uh, a woman's number of births is the outcome. Uh, and I'm showing you differences between communities here. So, in plot A, you see average fertility going down as average education goes up. Um, in so, in, uh, you have basically half the number of children um, in uh, one side of this distribution compared to on the other side of the distribution. Uh, in plot B, you see the variation in fertility goes down as average education goes up, uh, which makes a lot of sense. If everybody's getting educated and everyone's reducing their fertility, this is the pattern that you would expect to see. But plot C here is surprising because here we see variation in predicted fertility against variation in education in the community. And we would expect to see exactly the same pattern here if what I've just said is true. But instead we don't see that pattern. And what that means is that something else is driving this convergence on low fertility. This convergence is happening independent of individual characteristics. So what that means is that a less educated woman uh, is reducing her fertility in the presence of higher educated women but she also tended to have more educated friends outside her community, which I think is potential evidence for converging values based both on a social learning, either horizontally within communities, but also potentially, uh, sorry, horizontally across communities, but also potentially via prestige and success biases within them. And we followed up this paper with a paper on contraception. And what we were interested in was how local definitions of contraceptives, so artificial methods versus um, any methods of contraception um, were diffusing differently in women's ego networks. So artificial methods here are what you might call modern methods um, and they're much more taboo in this context. And we collected data on 15 different kinds of methods. 
So the result here is basically that social clustering is extremely important when it comes to which contraceptives you use. The more women in your network that used a particular method, the more likely you were use, uh, using that method as well. And so this is potential evidence of uh, possible frequency dependence within those ego networks. Um, and what, what we also found is that women are successfully reducing their fertility, stopping early and shortening their reproductive spans using natural methods, which are less taboo. Finally, we also found in this paper that the more taboo methods were associated with levels of religiosity in the community, independent of your own religiosity. So um, whereas natural methods weren't affected in this way, which indicates a possible role for conformity in slowing the spread of artificial uh, or modern methods, but not uh, other kinds of methods. Uh, and so this paper is all about how women can learn within their uh, private social spaces about uh, innovations that they can potentially, um, that potentially violate group level norms. The third paper also from 2015 was focused on how wealth and status dynamics are also changing during this transition period. So uh, here we show that the broadly positive association between wealth, status and fertility tends to reverse as we know, but also that wealth inequalities increase and then temporarily decrease as fertility declines in the course of market integration. So all this change is happening simultaneously. So pulling out just one predictor like women's education can only tell you so much about um, the mechanisms that in this place where, where, fertility, uh, where high fertility is still really valued um, are driving fertility down. And so I just wanna tell you in a bit more detail about a recent paper looking at the structure of women's social support networks and how they're also changing in the course of this extensive market integration. So I have, I have data on up to uh, five eco network partners for each of the 2000 women or so that we interviewed as part of this project. Uh, and we know how they're related to each other. Uh, the density of these networks is relatively high. On average, 80% of all possible connections are present given the size of the nominated network. And here I developed a new measure of kin density, which counts the proportion of ties between individuals that are kinship ties, instead of just counting the number of nodes that are kin. And that distinction is useful because these aren't the same thing. Uh, for example, if a woman adds her husband's kin uh, to her social support network after her marriage, uh, her kin density, in terms of her genealogical kin density, can actually decline, even though the proportion of kin in the network hasn't. And that matters because there's a lot of evidence from the cooperative breeding literature that women's and men's kin might have different effects on reproduction. And there's also this general idea that the more kin in your social support network per se, the more compounded uh, the influence of kin on reproduction will be. So we found that 38% of possible connections are kinship connections, given the size of the network. Uh, and looking across communities, we found that kin density is lower in households and communities that are more market integrated, even though overall density and size of the network isn't. So again, there's a multi-level point here, which is that independent of your own household's market integration, the integration of other people in your community somehow affects the loosening of your kin ties. Uh, and that's not due to a lack of kin, demographically speaking, uh, or to a range of other compositional features. Some elements of microstructure uh, in terms of social interactions are changing during these transitions. And this is just one mechanism at one level of aggregation, consistent with the loosening of kinship connections. Um, and while this doesn't mean that cooperative breeding per se isn't still happening, it does mean that there are implications for how resources and importantly information flows between individuals. So just by way of a summary of this bit of uh, work, um, I want to say that basically there's a lot of complexity when you start collecting this kind of data. There's individual community and network characteristics, all of which matter for understanding changing demography. Uh, cultural evolution needs to build on these kinds of foundations in addition to foundational analogies with population genetics, but there's very little theory that actually is designed to meet this kind of data face to face. Uh, demographic data need to come in some cases before the models because the success of any generative inference approach is going to depend uh, on the models themselves and that's going to depend on having this kind of rich knowledge in there in the first place. And for that reason, we need obviously multi-level theory as well as data. Um, now, one of the group members, Elena Mew, who's a postdoc in the group is uh, taking this further now at the moment, she's looking at female friendship and the horizontal transmission of low fertility values. So we're going further into this direction, looking at changing social support, uh, the replacement of kin ties and social uh, support types uh, and how uh, values about reproduction are actually clustering. Uh, in ego networks. So we're, we're hoping to be able to evaluate the potential for horizontal transmission uh, in the future, in, you know, in the, in the not too distant future, hopefully. Um, and we're also expanding this project 
to digitize huge amounts of historical data going back to before the Industrial Revolution in this region. So we're working together with regional church authorities to scan thousands of records that have information on tens of thousands of individuals in this region so we can examine much longer term demographic trajectories of the peasant farming communities uh, of the past in this region. Okay, so I've shown you some quantitative research and now I want to show you some ethnographic research. Um, I wanna convince you that ethnography is essential to rejecting ideas of natural fertility. And now I'm gonna focus um, on my research in Vanuatu. So I've been working in Vanuatu since 2015. Uh, Vanuatu is an archipelago of about 80 islands. It has a population of about 300,000 people and it was a joint colony of Britain and France until 1980. Vanuatu is famous around the world for being extremely culturally and linguistically diverse. Uh, it's the most linguistically dense place per capita uh, in the world with a, 138 Austronesian languages. Uh, all the work I do in Vanuatu is done in close partnership with the Vanuatu Cultural Centre and its network of indigenous field researchers. And here I just acknowledge some of the people who've helped to make this work uh, possible. The backdrop to the extreme diversity that we see today in Vanuatu is a very complex uh, but short demographic history, which involved multiple waves of migration that brought groups with very different genetic, cultural and linguistic ancestries into networks of contact. So it wasn't until about 3,000 uh, years ago that the first people crossed the boundary between what's called near and remote Oceania uh, to reach Vanuatu for the first time. And that was part of the broader population expansion which carried the Austronesian language family out into remote Oceania. In 2018, we published a collaborative study that used a combination of ancient and contemporary DNA collected as part of my field project uh, to show that shortly after initial settlement, there was a process uh, of genetic population replacement that took a place over about a thousand years uh, with different peoples coming in from near Oceania. So the plot on the right uh, shows you the genetic composition of the population through time and the proportion of ancestry from so-called Austronesian sources. So contemporary Nivanuatu carry extremely high levels of ancestry from near Oceania, uh, but the picture is even more complicated than this. Uh, and there's still a lot of debate about this uh, research and there's still a lot of research coming out about this topic. Um, but the best fitting demographic models of these processes are very complicated ones. They're much uh, more complicated than simple waves of replacement uh, and they involve multiple admixture events in the past. And there was a bit of a paradox here because Austronesian languages are still spoken in Vanuatu today exclusively Whereas the incoming populations uh, were probably associated with different language families in near Oceania. So we argued in this paper that the ancestor of the current languages of Vanuatu was potentially used as a lingua franca by the incoming populations. And that speaks to this idea that there was ongoing contact between different groups. Now the archeology span of Vanuatu shows evidence of extensive trade routes and interaction spheres within the archipelago um, but there are also macro cultural features that are similar across areas of, uh, of Melanesia, like, for example, pig, pig exchange economies, uh, different kinds of political systems and kinship systems. And these all have important implications for the organization of reproduction in a way that simply explodes the complexities that we have to think about when inferring demographic phenomena. Uh, and this diversity means we can't assume demographic uniformitarianism, even within one country, uh, as we can in Poland, for example. It's just the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, and so part of my ongoing work is to understand how demographic and social processes generated this diversity uh, and also how they contribute to maintaining or eroding it in the present day. So the project I've been developing is a high diversity component, uh, complement, sorry, to the Polish project. Uh, and so I collect comparable information, but I also work in lots of interdisciplinary projects because there's just so many aspects to these questions. Um, and a huge part of my work in Vanuatu has been um, old school ethnography, participant observation. Um, the people that I work most closely with are the Big Nambas people of Northwest Malakula, which is the second largest island in the archipelago. But the Big Nambas are the largest ethno-linguistic group on Malakula. Uh, they have a long history of expansionary raiding, a complex political system that combines egalitarianism and strict hierarchies, uh, a clan-based structure, and an explicit ideology uh, in, in the current day uh, and probably also in the past of lineage growth and competition. So what looks like natural fertility here is in fact highly organized and highly regulated. 
And it's really important not to treat indigenous reproductive dynamics as if they're somehow homeostatic or stuck in prehistory. The damage that natural fertility does is to relegate some communities to being pre-modern or unconscious of their own reproductive politics. And in reality, um, reproductive dynamics are always responding to current events in a particular place and time. So a major part of my Vanuatu work is studying the impact of history, um, of colonialism and of today's rapidly changing uh, post-colonial context on reproduction. So my fieldwork is, is structured and focused around three sort of sets of cohorts that capture many of these different changes. So if you go back two to three generations, uh, from, the, from the current um, generation in Vanuatu where I'm working, uh, you find very strong customary traditions and language, uh, indigenous language use, uh, a strong rejection of Christianity and actually relatively low fertility, which I think surprises a lot of people. But men and women did not live in the same houses um, pre-missionization uh, and actually that contributed to relatively low fertility. Um, in, in more recent generations, just looking one to two generations back, you have this um, context of an erosion and a subsequent revival of customary practices and language, uh, but in a context where it's exclusively Christian um, and there's a rapid increase uh, in fertility driven actually by, uh, by a lot of the missionary uh, interventions, including making people uh, cohabit in the same household. Uh, and in the current generations, we're in a context of the loss and regain and reclaiming of customary knowledge um, uh, and languages, um, but we have a lot of diverse uh, Christian denominations uh, all over the place. Um, and now people are going through uh, the, the demographic transition. So obviously it's another context to, to bear in mind. So these are just some examples of the things that I tend to think about when I think about the differences between these cohorts. But even these things are, 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 are items that, you know, as an outsider, I'm tempted to focus on. And of course, um, reproductive norms and practices are indigenously defined. So I work with a network of women uh, I also work with men on projects to do with their interests, but uh, when it comes to reproduction, I work with women to understand the detailed mechanisms of reproduction and how people manage their fertility and their infertility, uh, their ritual supernatural elements of reproduction, menstruation and childbearing, women's power and customary roles. And one of the topics that I'm really interested in in the last few years is infertility and how infertility actually mobilizes cultural technologies of reproduction and what these reveal about indigenous attitudes to reproduction and demography. The World Health Organization defines infertility as a disease, a biological dysfunction in a specific embodied location. Now in Vanuatu, there's no assisted reproductive technologies and uh, infertility is certainly not on the development agenda because these are the kinds of places where it's desired that fertility be reduced. So infertility is a sort of invisible problem in, in much developmental research. Uh, development research, sorry. Uh, and that means that uh, infertility is reckoned with very much at a community level. So what happens to women here um, who can't reproduce? Um, well, it might surprise you. Often local responses to infertility include anger. They include a demand for physical labor. They include increased sharing of goods, and compensation payments. They often in involve uh, policing of women's movements and speech. Uh, and in extreme cases, the withholding of food information and social contact. Now to Westerners, these actions are really harsh. Uh, surely more support in food sharing or the relaxation of garden labor would relieve some of the physiological constraints on conception or reduce stress somehow. These are the kinds of things that we think about. But they're not that salient uh, in the big numbers context because reproduction as in other Melanesian places isn't really understood to be determined purely by or even importantly by physiological limitations. Instead, the major determinant of reproduction, and as a result, the first target of correctional activity where infertility is concerned, is the will and the social comportment of the woman herself. So infertility or a lack of reproductive activity is not primarily interpreted as an inability to physically get pregnant, but an unwillingness to. It's seen as an active attempt to block the continuity of the patrilineage. And to understand this, we need to appreciate that reproductive activity in this context and therefore reproductive responsibility is distributed among the women of a patrilineal compound, with the result that the costs of infertility are borne in complex ways by all its members. Um, so for example, um, the kinship terms uh, in this area uh, blur distinctions between women. Um, so all in marrying women are referred to as mother by all the children. Um, leveret marriage, uh, which involves uh, the marrying of your deceased husband's brother um, is uh, the dominant marriage uh, strategy here, and that keeps women 
in the patrilineage, but also there's a kinship term, which is interesting, which is that uh, in marrying women are referred to by all brothers as uh, mother of our children. So that clearly indicates that there's an expectation they may have to reproduce with more than one of them. Uh, children can also be easily incorporated into these patrilineages through specific linguistically marked uh, compensation payments. So uh, for that reason, it's actually okay for women to have reproduced before they marry, because there are uh, before they marry, because there are clear ways to bring their children into uh, into the lineage. Um, and importantly, the implication here is that men's political status um, is often more determined by uh, whether they have sons and how many they have, rather than the other way around. Um, because in order for men to obtain rank and title in this very hierarchical system, um, they need to have sons to pass it on to. And so this generates a whole set of uh, interesting dynamics. Uh, so the point is there's, there's important implications of this way of, of viewing um, ownership and personhood and how families are made. Uh, and there are many social technologies of reproduction that facilitate uh, what I call reproductive pooling in this context. And in the ethnography of Vanuatu, as well as other parts of Oceania, it's understood that while reproduction of the lineage itself doesn't properly belong to women in the sense that they're not entitled to a major stake in its political or social fate, but they're nonetheless the essential conduits, the instruments uh, of the production of men. And they therefore wield enormous power via their reproductive capacities. The greatest danger they can pose is to refuse to reproduce at all. And um, Holly Wardlow, who is an ethnographer of the Huli in Papua New Guinea, calls this kind of refusal negative agency. In Malakula, women who don't reproduce are sometimes seen, therefore, to be in active conflict with the interests of the lineage that they married into. And this sets off a whole host of social dynamics that are completely unexpected from a Western point of view. Understanding all of this means getting to grips with broader ethnography uh, in Melanesia. And in this region, what gets emphasized is how relations are created between people and how personhood itself is distributed and relational. So what I mean by that is that social relations are actually produced through exchange. Um, possessive individualism, as we understand it in the West, is not considered to be that important. So for example, your labor doesn't imply ownership and uh, work doesn't produce alienable products that you can exchange without any implications for other people. As a result, personhood, including things like your gender, uh, is co-produced through relations, exchanges, and transformations that happen throughout your life history. Um, and as a result, um, Marilyn Strathern, who's, who's the author of this very seminal text in the field, um, argues that there are no individuals uh, in this area of the world. Persons are, uh, as she calls them, individual. Uh, in other words, they're partial, they're not given a priori, and, and their personhood doesn't end at the boundaries of their body. So all of these ideas have important theoretical implications, I believe, um, and they help us develop better and more ethnographically informed quantitative data collection, but there are also elements here that we can start with to develop models to better understand the causal structure of reproduction. We can't wave all of this away under the idea of natural fertility when it exists in such a rich set of indigenous ideas about reproduction. I've just given you a tiny example of an extraordinarily rich ethnographic literature on reproduction in anthropology, and we need to be reading this literature much more. Incidentally, I'm always looking for collaborators who are interested in challenging modeling projects, so if any of this has inspired you to work on some of these questions, please do get in touch with me. So just some general insights from this bit of work. Um, in Vanuatu, different waves of history and prehistory, as well as the colonial experience and the dynamics of diversity today have to be taken into account if we're going to talk about reproduction. And so it's difficult to just summarize it all as natural fertility. Before we can build any models though, we need to know the ethnography. We need to know the system, if you like. And that knowledge itself takes years to accumulate. Um, and we need to acknowledge um, that need for that time and make space for it in our, um, you know, in our research practices. Involving local communities in that research is critical to learning what the mechanisms are and what categories are salient and important. Um, and uh, so it's really, really critical that we co-produce this work with the people that we're working with. So um, in the final section here, I want to just give you a very short example of how we are developing modeling to help understand the effect of culture on reproduction in ways that can help us think through the cultural dynamics that are, that are happening. So um, the ethnography in the, in the previous section is the source for the kind of modeling 
um, that I'm already doing, but I'm going to give you a test case example uh, from the Gambia, which is based on Caroline Bledsoe's research in, um, uh, in the Gambia. So as I mentioned before, for, for women in the Gambia in this ethnographic context, age isn't based on how many years you've been alive, but on how much reproductive activity you've experienced. And so you move between different indigenously defined age categories, depending on how you curate your reproductive career. So here are the basic age concepts and their associated biological age ranges. So just focus on the highlighted ones in the middle uh, and note that they span the entire reproductive age range. So which one of these two categories you fall into depends on the effects of births, miscarriages, losses, insufficient recoveries after childbirth. These are events that use up a limited amount of what are called muscles that a woman has. A becoming sarifo, which is this bottom category here, uh, means that you retire from reproductive life. Um, but that can, that can happen to you anytime between the ages of 29 and 47. Now, ethnography is the only way to get this information, uh, to understand that reproduction is regulated by these categories and identities in this place. But we also need quantitative data to know if these indigenous categories structure demographic characteristics. So Bledsoe asked, how many more children do you want? Um, and if we focus on just the women who answered none in black, we see that on the left, a biological age distribution gives us a linear picture of an increasing desire to stop reproducing. But on the right is the exact same data using the indigenous categories. And now we see more of a threshold or a step function. And what matters is if a woman identifies as serifo or not. This isn't just culture as description, it's, it's culture as causality. So the causal logic of reproductive decision-making here moves a woman between different age categories and that can affect the demography. So here are some basic uh, parameters that might go into configuring uh, a model of this process. And this is work by Tom Holding, who's also a postdoc uh, in the research group here in Leipzig. Um, what we do is we need to define rules about how many reproductive units might move a simulated individual into a new age category and how much birth spacing and baseline fertility rates are modified in each of those categories. And actually getting to this point is where the core of the work is, because this is the hardest part, because you've got to decide how to distill ethnographic claims into simple, into simple claims that can be modeled. And this is really, really where the difficult work is, because the next step is just to simulate the population level outcomes and explore the dynamics. So here I'm showing you birth and death rates over time and population pyramids, uh, age distributions for two different scenarios. On the left is a model of natural fertility, natural population growth based on biological age growing rapidly. Uh, and on the right is a model that also incorporates the cultural age structure. And you can see that the growth is a bit slower. So what's happening here is that women um, are moving into the serifo age group, which is this yellow line here, once they've used up their muscles. Um, so that's, that's the group that they move into around this age distribution, uh, which removes them from the reproductive pool. Okay, so imagine now that we add a family planning intervention that makes contraceptives freely available. In the baseline model, contraceptives actually increase the growth rate, which is what we would expect. But on the right, contraceptives actually slightly increase um, the growth rate, um, which is not what we expect, uh, but it actually happened uh, in real world Gambia. And the reason it happens is again, our cultural mechanism. So with contraception, women actually waste fewer muscles, they efficiently space their births, and they have more live births overall. They move into the serifo category later at a lower rate, keeping them in the reproductive pool for longer. And I think this is just really cool because it shows that po uh, public policy interventions are interventions on cultural systems and not just interventions into baseline biology. This shows us why interventions that don't take culture into account can have unintended consequences, and it gives us insights into how interventions can change the cultural features themselves. So if you just imagine if fewer people become serifo over time, maybe the category will become less culturally salient. And this is the, precisely the kind of process that cultural evolutionists want to understand. Um, now, this is about taking indigenous categories seriously and translating them into a form that lets us explore if and how they modify already well understood processes. We can borrow lots of tools from demography to do this, and that I think will transform the precision of our cultural evolution hypotheses. But clearly we need to know the ethnography to build the model in the first place.
This is part um, of a broader uh, project that we're developing here at the Institute, which is to build an agent-based modeling environment specifically for this kind of task. So specifically for translating ethnographic claims into simple agent-based models that we can explore um, their uh, implications. Um, and so, uh, you know, watch this space. We're hoping that we'll be able to have a freely available uh, environment for people to instantiate their own hypotheses in the future. So I want to finish by saying um, the following, uh, you know, if we're going to take cultural evolution seriously, uh, we really cannot re relegate reproductive behavior, which is central to human social life, to either a pre-conscious state or a set of self-organizing dynamics that don't have historical or political context. We can't assume demographic uniformitarianism a priori. Um, our models need to start taking indigenous categories seriously because that is what drives a lot of reproductive um, energy. Um, and our inferential methods, uh, to the extent that they're powerful, require salient and maximally informative quantitative data to be able to unleash their full inferential power. But before we build those models, we need to know our mechanisms. Uh, and so there is a call to really recenter ethnography into the heart of evolutionary anthropology. And um, I think for the field to move forward on this, we need to make it easier to develop models. And we also need to create space for ethnographic work that is needed to describe empirical phenomena and articulate new hypotheses. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heidi, for a fascinating talk. So just to remind people, if you have any questions, please do put them in the question and answer uh, box. Uh, we've already got one in there. So while we move on to that, uh, we will uh, people uh, can start thinking uh, about their questions. Um, so first question is, um, how much data do you have on conversations between women on reproduction, the desirability of children, um, and how does that compare with uh, the kind of conversations that men have on these topics? That's an easy one. Uh, none at the moment, um, <laughs> but um, it is a really interesting area um, of uh, future uh, research. So, um, I there's a really lovely paper by Leslie Newson. Um, which is uh, actually looking at exactly this question. So she showed uh, vignettes to um, participants um, and they role played uh, the role of either uh, a mother or uh, I think it was a, a non-related friend and uh, looked at how conversations about reproduction uh, differed depending on which role you played. And uh, she was able to show that indeed they do make a difference in that uh, interactions between uh, related people tended to um, give advice about reproduction that was consistent with uh, reproductive success, whereas um, the interactions with non-kin uh, did not. Now, I, I think it's really high time that somebody expanded upon that uh, research because um, I don't think anyone's really picked up on that, and I think it's a really interesting area to go down. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of arguments uh, about this sort of set of distinguishing factors between, you know, how we talk to kin, how we talk to non-kin, because of course, in the context of demographic change, um, both the kin and the non-kin um, might be encouraging people to have fewer children. So again, I, want, I don't want to emphasize uh, or, or, you know, reify this distinction between kin makes people have more children and non-kin makes people have fewer children. Um, there's, there's elements going on at different levels of analysis, but definitely um, it would be lovely to do some you know, some content analysis or even some textual analysis of, of these kinds of things, yeah. Are there norms around family size in, in Vanuatu? Um, I wouldn't say that there are specific quantities um, that people are interested in maximizing. They're interested in having um, many, many boys. Um, men are important, but women are also important for all the reasons I mentioned. They're, they create um, exchange networks. They are called, you know, women are often described as roads because they, they cut the road between to communities by by leaving and uh, women in this particular um, community tend to be exogamous so they tend to leave the community after marriage but um, the big numbers group is so big that actually um, demographically speaking that um, there's also space for women to to move around endogamously but generally speaking um, the more the merrier um, from the men's perspective certainly and uh, in the current context um, there's definitely a, a change. Um, so, and this gets really complicated because I think in some cases, 
um, women are navigating uh, very patriarchal rules um, by uh, co-opting in some cases, uh, you know, these, these external narratives of population control and climate change in order to reduce um, the number of sons and daughters that they provide to the lineage. Um, so I think uh, things are changing and people are starting to think about, you know, smaller family sizes now. One, one thing that your, your talk made me think about was, um, it seems like when we think about kind of conscious family planning or conscious decisions about reproduction, there's, there's potentially two elements that we can pick out here. So one would be a kind of a, this idea of the cultural practices or cultural norms, which you know, have some general effect of the population. Um, and then, but then there's also an element of individual decision-making based on um, circumstances and, you know, uh, and all those kind of things. So um, do you have a, a sense about kind of either kind of the relative importance of those or the interplay between them? Um, I mean, they definitely interplay. Um, people are always, you know, yeah, we always have to be really careful not to um, essentialize uh, groups as being determined by their culture. And that's certainly not the, the line that I'm, that I'm pushing um, with this research. So um, it, it's not to say that um, individuals don't make decisions. It's not to say that uh, culture, you know, people are cultural dopes, right? This, this idea that uh, often cultural evolutionists get criticized for. Um, it's not that people are blindly just following the rules or whatever they are. And, and I mean, even in the most strict example of you know a kinship system where it's very clear who you're supposed to marry and who you're not supposed to marry I mean people break the rules all the time so um, uh, I don't think there's a slavish um, following of uh, you know necessarily explicit norms but I do think there's um, all sorts of things going on right uh, at the individual level individuals are trying to navigate their their reproductive lives in ways that are you know beneficial to them and their families um, at institutional levels, you know, there are some reproductive values that are, are quite institutionalized and others which are quite, um, people may not even be aware about them. Um, there's a great example in, in Germany, actually, um, uh, there's this concept um, called uh, the Rabenmutter, which is uh, translates as raven mother. And it, it's a concept that goes back to, I think, the 1300s uh, from a natural, uh, a book by a naturalist. And um, it describes the, the raven mother who leaves the, the eggs in the nest. And it's used in Western Germany, but not in Eastern Germany, which is really interesting, um, to denigrate women who go back to work after having children. And so what it actually does, it, it has a demographic impact. It, it's really highly stigmatizing. And um, there's, very, uh, there's, there's much fewer highly educated um, women with children who are in the workforce um, in Western Germany as a result of this taboo, uh, because they're typically expected to stay at home and do a lot of the childcare compared to Eastern Germany, which obviously has the experience of socialism and full employment of women and maternity care, where that taboo just doesn't seem to operate anymore. So um, you, we don't have to go to exotic locations or you know, even you know, the deep ethnographic record to find examples where cultural features that are maybe not even conscious for people in this case, um, but they're, they're talked about, but people might not say this particular taboo is operating in my life, but it, it's nonetheless having an effect in the aggregate. That leads uh, quite nicely onto a question um, uh, that kind of ties in with some of these things about um, uh, economics. So um, the question here is how should um, underlying economic structures be incorporated into the analysis of fertility? Um, in, the, in the case of contraception with the Sarah class, is this uh, an economic spacing? So I think kind of in general, kind of what's the role of economic decision making and th well, thinking about kind of economic decision making more, more generally, right? Broadly. Yeah, well, I mean, I think part of the issue that we have when we talk about this kind of thing is that uh, we keep trying to split it up into economics and culture, and I don't really think that's going to help any of us. Um, so, you know, economic decision making can also be reproductive decision making for sure, um, but it doesn't always have to be. So that's the point I want to make. So, you know, we have very, very famous economic theory from Becker um, all the way to the present day um, talking about uh, you know, uh, the economics of the family, uh, you know, children is, as normal goods and trade-offs in quality and quantity and all that stuff is extremely important and useful. What we do need to know is where do those trade-offs come from and why are they going in the direction um, that they're going in now and why, you know, there's, there's, they're not inevitable. You know, it's not inevitable that those trade-offs have worked out in the way that they have. It's not inevitable that we live 
in contemporary societies where work and childbearing is practically incompatible for, for women. Um, we invented that, right? <laughs> and we can change it if we want to. So this is there's a slight emancipatory role to thinking about um, how you know how important cultural change could be in influencing um, economic uh, underpinnings of reproduction. There's nothing purely determinist here. This is all co-evolving. And I think, uh, you know, we, uh, the, the more we make ourselves aware of that, the more we have possible, you know, even political implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess, so, I mean, so that, that kind of, that economic aspect can come in at both affecting kind of what are predominant norms and cultural norms, but also you know, individual decision-making as well, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I use cultural evolution as an umbrella um, discipline to situate this work because I think it's powerful for um, because of its interest in cultural change um, and its powerful uh, baseline of, uh, you know, mathematical modeling. And so for me, that's the home for this kind of research. But I could reframe this in economic terms if I wanted to uh, and, and house it in, you know, under an economic model. But I find personally the cultural evolution approach to be um, broader, and um, I see economics as part of that bigger um, effort. Mm, brilliant. Um, okay, another question uh, from Leslie. Uh, wonderful talk, Heidi. Any cultural trait that affects the efficiency of reproduction will, in theory, be subject to natural selection. Um, it might take several generations for these effects to be noticed. Um, are there any plans uh, to attempt to explain how some high fertility populations fend off low fertility norms? Um, do you think they will be able to continue to do this? Uh, so I, I know I know the backstory to Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the question the, behind the question. The question behind the question is probably something like, you know, these incredible incredibly culturally resilient communities like uh, the Amish or the old uh, order Anabaptists in, in North America and various other places. Um, and, um, you know, this touches on a, a broader set of, of questions that are quite active in um, political demography. Um, so there are people working on these kinds of questions about how, you know, just through purely demographic um, replacement effectively, um, certain uh, groups that have certain sets of re reproductive values will necessarily out reproduce um, the ones who don't have those values. Um, and um, certainly movements like the voluntary extinction movement are you know, unlikely to be around um, you know, for very long if they actually do voluntarily extinguish themselves. Um, so I, I, I don't know that I have um, clear plans to look at this in terms of long run evolutionary dynamics in that sense. One of the things that I am really interested in though is looking in the longer term, um, once we have this modeling environment up and running, uh, looking at how um, we might be able to say things about ancient um, uh, genetic uh, distributions uh, by properly modeling the suite of possible underlying generative processes that could have generated that uh, those kinds of distributions because I think this is something that geneticists are extremely interested in now in, in terms of trying to understand how uh, social organization generates uh, you know leaves genetic legacies and um, so I think we can I think in that direction I'm really uh, interested in seeing where we can push this because I think if we start really from the bottom and scale up that's exactly where we can be most useful we can say you know this distribution uh, of let's say genetic uh, data at some time period could be consistent with um, you know x y and z set of cultural processes so I think that's one way to um, I know I'm not sure it would get at this question of like did, did one group out reproduce each other were they selected I mean I'm not sure we need to invoke selection at that at that level but um, there's other processes that could be um, leaving um, signatures in the genetic um, record that, that aren't necessarily to do with selection but um, I do think that's where we can be really helpful to um, large swathes of the mm -hmm. population sciences. And that's kind mm -hmm. of where I want this to go in the long term. Yeah. And so in the, I mean, in Vanuatu, right, you've got these different groups and you mentioned how uh, one group is demographically dominant. Um, do you A, kind of know, is there is there variation in, uh, you know, fertility norms or kind of, you know, reproductive rates amongst these groups? And do we know anything about kind of the, the history of um, the, the demographics of these groups? And if one group is producing more people, are they getting incorporated into other groups or are they gradually, uh, you know, displacing them or uh, those um, kind of things? It, 
Yeah, no, great questions. Mm. There's a couple of things to say. One is that um, we don't have very fine grained demographic data, um, so it's quite hard to say. Um, but that's one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do. So I am, I am, you know, for my sins, trying to collect demographic data on all of the 12 um, clans uh, of this particular group, which includes, you know, his, uh, historical information about um, their families. And you can, you know, when you interview people, you can get information back about four generations. Um, it, there is interesting linguistic evidence um, for um, that kind of expansion in the past, because there's evidence of, um, uh, you know, linguistic commonalities and shifts across uh, the languages of Malakula. Um, so there's um, a PhD student um, who's just finished called uh, Royce Dodd, who just did his entire PhD uh, project on, on this topic. So um, there, there should be some interesting linguistic evidence on, on that question. But in terms of the broader question of, you know, expansion, incorporation of, uh, of people, you know, this kind of these mechanisms for incorporating potentially non-biological um, uh, kin into the you know ethno-linguistic group as part of this expansionary uh, process, I would I would definitely point you to the Marindanim example that I gave earlier in the talk, um, where this is definitely the case. So um, this was a this was a, a, a an, this is an ethno-linguistic group that is you know at some point at its maximum was uh, about sixteen thousand people as far as I know with no discernible hierarchical political hierarchy. Um, but where extreme, you know, this expansion was absolutely doing uh, what you say. So they were, they were moving out into other ethno-linguistic groups. They were incorporating or kidnapping or adopting um, children from those groups, raising them as members of that ethno-linguistic group without their knowledge that they'd ever come from another place. And so, you know, if you went there and you sampled um, genetics there, you'd probably think, uh, wow, this is a, you know, you think this is a really diverse um, genetic um, population, but in fact, ethno-linguistically, it's very homogenous. So um, there's lots of different layers here. Um, and so I, I definitely think elements of that are, are probably going on um, in, in Malakula to a, to a smaller degree. But then, um, you know, there's about 40 languages on Malakula, which is about the diversity of all of Europe in, in a population of about 25,000 people. So um, I have visited numerous other groups there, and I have I do work with other groups on Malakula, but I haven't kind of done the deep dive to the same extent. So, the the, the wonderful thing about working in Vanuatu is there's just enough stuff to do for, you know, hundred lifetimes. So um, I don't think I'm gonna get to the bottom of everything, but I'll, I'll certainly do my best. Keep you busy, yeah. So I mean, so one of the questions that's just come up, um, you know, I think, and it's a question that people unfamiliar with this region will. Be amazed by it is how many you know how many languages there are in such a small space and um what are the what are the reasons behind that do we think well this is the million dollar question right and <laughs> um, so we know that we know that uh you know there was nobody living in Vanuatu about three thousand years ago um <clears throat> and we know that people came in from via you know partly through the austronesian expansion and then partly also from near Oceania, which would have been drastically different language families. So, um, you know, the Austronesian language family is one family, but in, in, you know, Papua New Guinea, in the island of New Guinea, you've got about 15 different language families. So um, the diversity that was coming in potentially through, you know, long-term migration is also um, very high. But what we do know is that there's very little evidence of Papuan related uh, linguistic um, contact in the languages of Vanuatu. So. Um, there are some features that look to be potentially of, of Papuan origin, but um, the languages are all Austronesian. So um, the, you know, there's various hypotheses that you could posit about how that language diversification sort of emerged. And I don't think that there's a clear answer yet, but you could, you know, this is a typical, you know, island dispersal model where you, you imagine people arrive on an island, they quickly diversify and then it slows down and then they move to another island, but it doesn't necessarily look like that. Um, in Vanuatu because um, there aren't these kind of geographic boundaries to, um, you know, it's not isolation by distance. Um, if anything, it's it's diversification through contact um, because there aren't these geographic boundaries um, to interaction between communities like you would see, say, in, uh, you know, New Guinea. Um, and so what's really interesting for me is that uh, I really believe that, the, the, the you know, the, the, there are sociolinguistic reasons for uh, the diversification. There, it's about distinguishing yourself from other groups. It's about um, consciously creating those boundaries, um, um, but not in a way that 
you know, precludes contact in a way that maintains contact. And um, it's fascinating working in Vanuatu because, you know, I work where I work in particular is on a language boundary. And so, you know, you cross the river and someone addresses you, you know, says hello in a different language from the one just like five meters behind. And um, and it's all, um, you know, there's a great tolerance of diversity. Um, there's not this great desire to to reduce that distinctive diversity. It's 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 very important part of Nivanuatu identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I completely agree with the, the point you make about it's not uh, you know, geographical boundaries. You know, in my own work on this a long time ago, you know that that kind of came out. You know, the mountainous regions or whatever, or those kind of things weren't the driving force behind this, this kind of yeah this massive diversification. Uh, Pete. So uh, uh, back to the Austronesian influence. So those languages are uh, Austronesian uh, by classification. What about other cultural features like uh, chieftainship and taboo and all those classic uh, uh, Polynesian uh, 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 cultural features? Are they present or is it just the language that uh, is culturally Austronesian? It's such a fantastic question, and it's the question that I want to answer um, if I could, but I, I think part of it is it's just very difficult to, I would say there's influences from, from all over because there's, these are networks of contact, right? Um, so for example, the group that I'm working with, the Big Nambas, they have um, uh, a very strictly inherited um, political system. So they have a system of paramount chiefs, which at first glance might make you think, oh, this is a Polynesian influence. But actually, if you dig deeper into the ethnography of um, uh, New Guinea, you also find uh, chiefly systems there. Um, but they also have mixed this with, you know, very strong egalitarianism, lots and lots and lots of leveling mechanisms, including, I believe, in, in some contexts, reproductive leveling. Um, you have features uh, that are very consistent with um, cultures in, in New Guinea. So, you know, uh, the rearing of Tusker pigs, in some parts of Malakuli, you have head binding that's consistent with head binding elsewhere in Melanesia. Um, I think the problem is that, um, you know, how we measure this is, is probably a lot more difficult than how we measure, say, linguistic features. Um, and there's a lot less consensus on, on how we might go about doing that. Um, and at the, at the level of aggregation that you do measure things, uh, it's, it's, there's quite a lot of similarity, I would say, across Oceania generally. Um, but yeah, I do think that there are um, there are a lot of commonalities um, across Vanuatu and the Melanesian cultural sphere more broadly, definitely. Um, I've got uh, we've got a few more minutes. If you're happy to take a couple more questions, I've got maybe I've got maybe one more that I've got, and if anybody else has one last question on the Q and A. Um, so a lot of your talk um, emphasised kind of I guess pre-fertilization more forms of, of contraception um to what extent are you know post so you know uh, abortion or even yeah. infanticide you know obviously <laughs> treading yeah. dealing with it sensitively but um you know so yeah how important are those as mechanisms of, of uh, fertility absolutely. absolutely and they're both considered um part of natural fertility in most um <laughs> in most definitions of it so this is why it's such a frustrating concept to deal with, right? Because um, these are certainly not unconscious um, things that we do, right? And uh, certainly in uh, Melanesia, uh, infanticide and abortion are extraordinarily um, important in the history of understanding uh, these populations and certainly, you know, in all over the world. Um, so uh, when I talk about contraception, I include those things effectively, uh, but not many people do, I guess. <laughs> Um, okay, we'll go one last thing, following on from our, our previous uh, point, um, talking about the uh, the Tasmanian uh, issue in uh, in Australia and the kind of the population size and loss of technological um, complexity, I guess. Um, and the question is, what makes dynamics of language evolution fundamentally different from technology? Well, um, I'm not a linguist. Is it? <laughs> first uh, a disclaimer. So uh, I don't necessarily have uh, a good answer to that question. Um, I would think that people who are working on things like cultural phylogenetics might argue um, that um, there are certain ways that you can organize data that are to 
uh, use methods from biological sciences that would allow you to make inferences about rates of change and all that kind of thing in ways that are analogous. But um, uh, certainly, uh, I am not an expert in either those methods or in detailed linguistic analysis. So I will um, mm -hmm. beg to remain silent on that question. <laughs> Well, I guess one fundamental one we could think about one fundamental difference, right, is that a language is a kind of a shared cultural sure. system that is, um, uh, you know, it has to be shared and has to be continuously used in order to to exist. Um, whereas, you know, technology can drop out and people can still carry on. It's like kind of more of a individually used um, feature that's not, you know, not. Mm as intrinsically linked i don't know but uh, i think they're kind of i've got a, i feel like they're kind of separate slightly separate issues that is so one is about kind of complexity or amount of technology whereas the other one is about um numbers well, numbers that, of languages in an area right so uh, different right, processes so, yeah and, and i mean you're talking about different things you're talking about the density of languages the disparity of languages and the diversity of languages and they're, all <laughs> different, they're all different measures um and yeah. have different implications yeah well in, yeah. in the an important factor, it seems to me, is that uh, a technology variation in technology typically has material consequences, whereas there are no first order uh, implications of choosing a different word. I mean, uh, the uh, words are, are uh, functionally neutral with respect to one another. What we call something is just arbitrary. And so the uh, linguistic space is full of neutral variation, whereas the technology space, I'm would argue is probably much less like that. It's much, much more effective material consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think something another another point about the the kind of ethno linguistic groups is that actually the content of the languages is can be can be quite similar, right? But people will make a distinction. So you know what is decided as a, a dialect or a language is partly kind of socially uh, socially determined. Um, you got time for one more? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, okay, so do you feel there's an opportunity for your findings to uh, influence development policy? Um, I'm not the only one making these claims, so I don't want to say I'm going to change anything, but I would use this opportunity to big up all the people who work in the reproductive justice movement and people who um, uh, you know, who are fighting for these changes in, uh, in the development industry um, and who have been doing so for a very long time. And so um, I'm not sure that I as a singular individual can have that kind of impact, but if I can contribute to it by raising awareness about it, then I'm very happy to do that. Um, and I think it would be a, a good thing. I mean, your example at the end, right, showed, showed nicely kind of, you know, <laughs> you know how those, um, the effects of different policies and the effects of not um, taking into account cultural differences. Yeah, I think, and, I think that's right. And, you know, I think, you know, certainly the experience of um, the, you know, the attempted diffusion of contraception in sub-Saharan Africa has, um, you know, there's a huge demographic literature on, you know, why sub-Saharan Africa is sort of resistant to fertility decline. And of course it has, um, fertility has declined, um, but there's this, uh, you know, there's a well-known, you know, it's a well-known region in the demographic literature in terms of the cultural context of, of high fertility. It's very famous for that. But I think um, it's often treated as a sort of singular, you know, outlier example region of the world. And I think if we could just reframe, you know, it's a very simple thing I'm asking in some senses. It's just to reframe um, this domain of life, which we, we sort of forget. We treat it as an input into our models uh, and we treat it as uh, you know a set of parameters that we that we we know how they're caused um, and we put those into models and we put those into you know our policies um, i'm just asking to reframe all of that <laughs> as uh, something that's evolving right and something that people have got agency over and people do try to change and is politicized just like any other cultural feature that we study um, and uh, it's it's i find it fascinating that it is absent from the cultural evolution, you know, approach to a large extent, um, even though it's 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 there, right? It's there underneath the hood all the time, and that might just be my personal obsession because I see it under the hood all the time. Um, but I want to show, you know, does it actually matter? And in some cases, it might not matter that let's say cultural mechanisms uh, 
uh, influence fertility in some particular way uh, when you scale them up. Maybe it doesn't matter, but it will still be important to, to demonstrate rather than to assume um, that those cultural features should be just, um, you know, pushed aside as uh, coming under an umbrella of something naturalized. And I think it's the naturalization of people's culture that does the most violence. Interesting. Um, and one final thing, um, how, how are people doing out there given these, these crazy times? And In is Vanuatu, there a, you mean? Yeah, yeah, and is it vaccinate, how's vaccination going? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the borders are closed and they have been closed for a very long time. So unfortunately we haven't been able to do any field work since the pandemic began. And the vaccine rollout is, is going slowly, but it's, it's going. Um, uh, they haven't had uh, many cases. I think they've had three official cases. Uh, in total, but the borders are completely shut. So um, I think that's a very good strategy. Um, it's obviously difficult because they, you know, the economy relies a lot on tourism, but um, for the people, it's it's really great that they can get on with their lives as normal. And so hopefully, I'm very hoping, you know, very much hoping that they will, uh, you know, finish the vaccination rollout and then I can go and continue my field research there. Are there any issues with um, uptake or is it a supply? Uh, issue, yes, there, there are issues with uptake in the same way that there are in other parts of, of Oceania. So there's a lot of um, sort of fear and um, anti-vax sentiment, but also I think just a lot of fear because there's a lot of, um, um, you know, the medical system is quite remote to people's lives. And so um, vaccines are scary. Hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you so much for that, Heidi, and uh, for answering all those questions. And uh, thanks to everybody who submitted uh, all those great questions on, on the Q&A. So, uh, and just thanks. a reminder, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I yeah. just want to say thanks so much for, for having me, and thanks for yeah. listening. Yeah, yeah. Sergei? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm having... Oh, he's having some problems. Okay, we can't hear you. Anyway, okay. Uh, brilliant. Um, yeah, just to remind everybody, uh, the much earlier time for next week's seminar, which is the last in our series, um, it's going to be 7 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time, 12 midday uh, in the UK, uh, because our speaker is Naoko Matsumoto speaking from Japan. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for attending, and we hope to see as many of you as possible next week. And thank you, Heidi, again. Thank you. <laughs>